Welcome to Talk World Radio, a half-hour discussion of politics as if the people mattered. I'm David Swanson. This week on Talk World Radio, we are discussing peace building and women's rights, among other topics, with Sanam Naragi Anderlini, MBE, founder and CEO of International Civil Society Action Network, or ICANN, and director of the London School of Economics Center for Women, Peace and Security, who was awarded an MBE in 2020 in honor of her contributions to international Peace building. Sanam, welcome to Talk World Radio. Thank you. Very nice to be with you. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for the work you're doing. Uh, so, what is ICANN, the International Civil Society Action Network, uh, working on? So, we are a small organization, um, a nonprofit registered in the US, but we spearhead a network of independent, uh, women led peace building organizations in countries where there's war, basically. So, Yemen, Afghanistan, um, Colombia, all these places where there has been war historically or there's a c c continuation of conflict. And our work really is like we're, we're, we're like a bridge because we provide personal support to our partners. It's very difficult work. It can be very dangerous work um, that they're doing. We provide professional opportunities um, from training to advocacy for them to get known internationally. Uh, we run a fund and we give grants to them. Uh, as well for their organizations. And then on the other side of the coin, we do a lot of policy advocacy work. So we're trying to raise awareness um, um, in the international community around the fact that these people exist on the ground, that they're running to the problems. They are, um, when a crisis happens, it's the women peace builders who run to try and resolve it. And their approaches through mediation, through dialogue, through trust building, but also through providing resources and an alternative sort of vision for the future for, for their countries. I've I, I've spoken with a lot of groups like Nonviolent Peace Force that do unarmed accompaniment mm -hmm. and nonviolent resistance and and sort of civilian presence of internationals for protection. Do you is is this sort of part of what you do? Um, we personally don't, but our partners, as I say, on the ground. So my Yemeni partners on the ground have done mediation with the Houthis to make sure that kids that are sick cannot get access to humanitarian aid, for example. Or when COVID was happening, they were de providing the masks and the and the um, health sort of healthcare support, and that creates an alternative space to to deal with armed groups essentially. Um, so, but they are of the community. They are we call them locally rooted, and then what we do is we globally connect them with each other. Right, and. and how is the world doing uh, in terms of making peace? Because this sort of good local work is is kind of uphill uh, against the flow at the moment, it's, is it um, not? So, so what I say is that what I've seen over the years is that our governments are incredibly good at starting wars and they're terrible at stopping them and ending them. And even when we have got the research and the experience to say, and, and the, the very clear evidence that to stop these wars, you need to have the local voices in the process. You can't just say, we're going to have a conversation with the Taliban and we think they're credible, but Afghan women aren't. Um, uh, that leads you into a lot of trouble, as we've seen in the case of Afghanistan, but it's the same everywhere. And so, so we say, if you want to have peace, you need to talk to the peace actors and the peacemakers and the people who are living in the midst of violence, but choosing not to pick up a weapon. Um, and so my struggle is more with the international actors and our diplomat diplomatic community than, than with folks on the ground. If you want to have peace may be a key bit of the question there. I'm not convinced that the United States was trying to end the war in Afghanistan for 20 years or the, the US and the UK preventing negotiations in Ukraine this past spring. I, I'm not convinced that they're trying to make peace. Um, is, that, is, is that perhaps the bigger that hurdle? Is, that's certainly um, a big concern because the, the what we've seen since the end of the Cold War, the previous Cold War, we have another one coming, but the, but the previous Cold War, is that in a way the attitude has been, if we can bomb them, let's go bomb them. If bombing doesn't is not possible, let's sanction them to death. And if sanctions don't work, we will try and then sit at the table to figure out some alternative. But um, but the idea that the majority of the world's population want to live in peace and want to just get on with their lives in their own countries um, and build their own countries 
seems to have been forgotten. And, and the, the difficulty that we have is that I think it's being, our policies are far too driven by the sale of weapons and the companies that produce and benefit from the profits of war versus the vast majority of the rest of us who benefit from peace. So, so there's a kind of a assumption that war is good for business. No, war is good for a handful of businesses. Peace is good for the vast majority of businesses. And yet that vast majority have not been part of these discussions at all in any space. It's national security is you know kept to the supposed experts. I know there are some wars where public opinion, people never asked for it, you know, Libya, Syria. But if you look at wars like Afghanistan or Iraq, at the start, you can find polls that suggest fairly credibly majority support for starting the darn war. And then within a year and a half, always within a year and a half, you have a strong majority saying never should have started that war. But never do you have a strong majority saying end it because there's some sort of duty to the true to kill more troops because of the troops who already got killed. I, I, I can't explain. You know, it, I but... think that's the that's the kind of discourse that they create in Washington. Right. Which is that, um, first of all, the narrative for going to the Iraq war was clearly a lie. Um, let's be honest. Sure. Because, and actually, we really see it with Ukraine, because if Iraq had had uh, weapons of mass destruction, we would have been a lot more careful about bombing them, just the same way that we are right now with Russia. We're not going into Russia. We're not attacking Russia for the simple reason that they have nukes. So if, if Iraq had had the same kind of weaponry, we would have been very careful. We knew that they didn't have them. It was a, there was a different um, interest in terms of why the Iraq war was, was pursued, but it was sold to the public on a false narrative. In the case of Afghanistan, I think um, the story was, okay, we have to go and get bin Laden. There were, uh, even back 22 years ago, people were saying, or just after 9-11, people, there, were, there were voices in, in, in the US that were saying, this could be done not with the military, but through really good policing and really good intel and really targeted sort of interventions and so forth. But once you go in, once we're in Afghanistan and in the last 20 years, you're absolutely right. There was a systematic unwillingness to listen to the voices of the local people, to the voices of Afghan women, to anybody that was saying what you're doing is actually wrong and it's a waste of money and you're creating more problems. Um, and that needs to be that needs to be investigated because in the meantime, it's American soldiers and others' lives lost as well as Afghan soldiers, people who've been maimed and traumatized and so forth. And then lo and behold, it turns out that the negotiations were going on with the Taliban. I mean, we literally handed the country and all our equipment to the Taliban and walked out. And so if I was an American soldier, I'd be very, very upset about what was it all about? Um, and where is that conversation? And nobody is willing to have that conversation in public. I, uh, as someone who's never found a war in the history of the world launched by any country that wasn't based on lies, I, I have to, you know, applaud the Iraq war was based on lies, but then question the distinction with the, the Afghan war or any other war. Uh, and, oh, well, the story was we have to go get bin Laden. I mean, we shouldn't erase, just because certain people want us to, the fact that the Afghan government was willing to turn bin Laden over to a third country to be put on trial. And the United States didn't want him put on trial, wanted him as an excuse for a war. I mean, it, it, it's th th these are the questions that we never get um, answers to. Right. And, and especially in this country, um, the discourse around national security is so obscured and so kind of expertized, if you want, that that I always say we should democratize the discussions on security and just go out and ask people, what does security mean to you? at your community level, at your city level, at your state level, and then nationally. And COVID really showed that to us because um, we didn't have masks for our healthcare workers in the same period that we were testing new drones that could carry a nuclear warhead, and each drone is, costs about $180 million. So what, does, what do we mean by security? Um, and who is determining these things? And why does, the, why does the military budget keep going up when literally people, you know, don't have fuel or don't, don't have enough food. And, and it's, it's, it's the same here as it is in England. I've just come back from England and it's, and it's an absurd uh, situation on the ground there as well. 60%, the new prime minister wants to increase it, right? 60% increase to military spending. Right. It, it's, yeah, it, it, it's um, at, at a time when people are literally saying they're having to choose between fuel and food. 
Yeah. So how we're speaking with Sanam Naragi Anderlini and I, 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 Sanam, I wonder how the world is doing in terms of including women in efforts to make peace. Uh, certainly some people are more aware of the value of doing that, right? Uh, some people are. We have, um, in the last 20 years, we've managed to get many countries in support of what we is now a, a portfolio of 10 Security Council resolutions that call for the inclusion of women, call for basic things like saying you're doing humanitarian aid. Do you have a gendered analysis of who needs the aid, what kind of aid they need, who's delivering the aid? Very sort of practical things, um, which is still not getting done. 51% uh, of the world's members of member states of the UN have national action plans, have their own national policies talking about inclusion. Uh, but as we sit here, it's still not being implemented. And um, the interesting thing uh, when I look around the world in the places I've worked is that, you know, you'll have warring parties and they will be literally killing each other um, over all sorts of things, uh, disagreeing on everything. The minute you say, why don't we have women peace builders um, at the peace negotiations? These guys all stand shoulder to shoulder, completely unified and wanting to exclude women. And, and that's, that's the question. It's like, why do they not want women? And, and the reason is because the women who are doing the peace work on the ground hold these guys accountable. And uh, it's a little bit like, you know, the, 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 the myth or the assumption is that these conflicts are two-sided, you know, government or militias. And, and, um, and it's, it's like, no, but when it's inside a country and both sides are killing the ordinary people, the ordinary people have their own representation and communities and people emerge from communities that need to be at the peace tables as peace actors. And that's the shift that we're trying to have. We have a law in this country that says it should happen. But Mr. Khalil Zad, who was our envoy, completely flouted the law. Um, he wasn't held accountable for it uh, in the case of Afghanistan. Um, and it just continues. It's it's just ignored. These these things are complete. It's like a cafeteria where they ignore cer certain policies and laws that carry on with, with bad practices. Uh, Sanam, I don't know if you know the story of this film called Soldiers Without Guns about the New Zealand uh, peacekeeping effort in Bougainville, but uh, there, there's so many stories like this that strike me as showing the value of including local women who know what's actually going on and the value of not bringing guns. Uh, it seems to me that unarmed peacekeeping has statistically, although it's much smaller, has a much stronger record than armed peacekeeping. Uh, but when I, you know, talk to members of governments around the world about peacekeeping efforts, they say, oh, we're sending lots of women. And I, but are you sending any of them without guns? Well, oh, of course. I mean, that that's just beyond the pale. It's, why? Why, you know, these, why is that unacceptable? I mean, I think it's complicated because if you're sending, say, a unit of Indian troops to um, the, you know, Congo, DRC, to the Democratic Republic of Congo, right? Um, do you send them with weapons or not? You know, are they going to be completely sitting ducks being attacked by the local militias because they've come in as the UN peacekeepers? So there is an issue of, of you know, do you send in armed peacekeepers who are military personnel who have been trained but in peacekeeping, that's one side of the story. Um, and then the, the other side of the story is that, okay, once you are there or, or wherever you go, are you engaging and enabling the local? So the, if, if the Indians are in, in, in the Congo, are they then working closely and getting advice and, and heeding the, the warnings of the Congolese women who know their own communities and say what they need? Or are we actually, by bringing in international peacekeepers, putting some of those women at risk because then they're being raped by international peacekeepers? So, you know, these, th this is the complexity that, that, that happens in all of these places, right? And, and one answer to all this is, yes, all the peacekeeping should be, military peacekeeping should be done by women because at least that will stop the sexual exploitation and abuse that we've seen in different places. But there is also another argument that, the more women, women have, even women in uniform, even women with armed, with, with weaponry, when they're engaged in communities and, and, and so forth, they do engage, um, they do bring down the heat and they do have less aggressive interactions. Um, and so it actually helps resolve uh, issues more nonviolently. Even in the United States, we have um, 
evidence from policing that when we have women police officers, they do it differently. So there's something about the, the maybe it's the interactions with women, but it's also maybe the way women are strategizing and, and the tactics that they use. And those tactics could be taught to anybody, I think. Um, so so part of that is like, well, are we not valuing the, the approaches that, that women may use, whether they're local or, or coming in internationally? Yeah, very good questions. Um, one, one place uh, with perhaps every type of uh, mistaken disaster in recent years that you've written about recently is, is Afghanistan. Uh, we, what, if anything, has been learned? What, if anything, has been done right? Uh, and, and when and how should the, the United States and its friends have gotten out? So, so two things. I mean, all the work that I've done in the last 20-odd years of the advocacy that we've done, um, these days when I speak at, in events, I, I pose the question very simply. I say, you know, if Afghan women, peace builders, or the women pol politicians, judges, lawyers that we now see internationally that have, that have had to seek refuge outside the country and who are incredibly eloquent, uh, very strong women, if they had been an independent delegation in the talks in Doha, going back to 2008, 2009, 2014, et cetera, um, would we have ended up with Afghanistan as it is now? Would the Taliban have been able to get away with what they did? And everybody sits in the room and shakes their head. Um, so that's your answer. It's, it's the starting point is, should be, that they are part and parcel of negotiations, but not just shoved in, shoehorned into a delegation of, uh, of a government or, or militias. Women as independent delegations, women who have the expertise and have the track record of doing the peace work on the ground in, in, in their own context. Um, in, the, in the case of Afghanistan, I think one of the other things that, that is sadly missed was that in the 20 years with all the war and all the things that were going on, this is a very young country. It's 65% of the population is under the age of, of 25. Over 40% over 40 are under the age of 14. Um, so it was in the 20 years that there was international presence there, the society was also changing. And what we saw last year was that there were lawyers all over the country. There were journalists, all of young you know, women and men, but unbelievably... Um, articulate lawyers, judges, police officers, um, teachers, you know, all across the country. And that story was never told. They were building their country. Um, and, and if only we had listened to what they were saying and had them represented in the, in the, in the conversations that were happening in Doha, um, it would have been a very, very different story. But, you know, the Obama administration, the Trump administration, and the Biden administration all chose to go down the path of pretty much excluding the Afghan population and first dealing with the Taliban and then a very cursory involvement of, of the of, of government or po political actors in, in the process. Well, of course, waging a war uh, that uh, I, I, it's unclear whether it's ended in, a, in my sort of ancient understanding of war where you don't send missiles into a place you're not at war with anymore. Uh, but uh, it, it, it's, you know, that the, all the damage done for 20 years, now there's this seizing of several billion mm -hmm. dollars while, while children have nothing to eat. I mean, is this not potentially even worse it's, than... The, it's, you the know, it's three, three things which I think are happening, which are just terrible. Um, and again, nobody really wants to talk about them because they're so big. But one is that that we let the Taliban beat NATO. I mean, that's, that's big, <laughs> you know, it, it's, and, and by enabling that, we've signaled to all sorts of militia movements and others around the world that if you're very violent, if you're very patient, if you just keep at it at some point, the, you know, whether it's the United States or the, the NATO alliance, they will back up, back off because they'll get exhausted and they don't want to be around um, uh, your conflicts. But, but, what would, but what would NATO beating the Taliban have looked like? It, Is it, such a it, thing it, imaginable? It, so, so it, it, it could only have been done with a mix of military and political engagement. It, it could only have been done if, you had, if we had actually looked at how do you provide basic food, water, development opportunities, etc. for people so that 
the young men growing up didn't feel that they needed to go off and fight to earn a living or that they needed to go and avenge the death of their families because we dropped drones on their heads and you know but you know rain bullets on down from 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 the skies it it, it would it it needed a much more comprehensive approach but certainly when they sat down to the at the in the negotiations it should not have just been that half the room was the taliban and half the room was you know a mix of afghan political elite actors and you know we were basically handing over the country um that's that it it, it there's it couldn't have been a military solution but it it we failed in the diplomacy and the politics that that's where where the failure is but can you and are there other examples of it working develop a good democracy while one lacking one at home two dropping missiles it, on people's it, heads it, the question of whether you're building a democracy we can you can't go build a democracy somewhere you can create you can help the local voices that want and the local populations that have democratic um aspirations in terms of what democracy actually means and and enable the 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 environment but you can't bring democracy on the back of a of a donkey or on on the back of a bullet for sure um and that's again something that i don't think that we have understood in this country um I'm not sure ever actually uh, i was going to go back to 911 but i but i go back to kind of the many many coups and many other ways in which we've had interventions and and uh we have not been effective it, it, the sad part of all this is that in the case of iraq for example they went in they got rid of saddam hussein but again they didn't actually engage the iraqi population that was that had had democratic aspirations or had had some element of wanting a different type of uh, of a, of a state in an effective way we even had at, at one point we had i think a harvard academic who was drafting the new iraqi constitution you know how on earth is that going to be legitimate credible engaging the public it, it, it's it's a failure from the start absolutely there was there was a group called the revolutionary association of women of afghanistan rawa that i recall for geez decades i guess years and years and years was saying whenever this ends it's going to be a disaster the ending is going to be a disaster what comes next is going to be a disaster but it's going to be less of a disaster the sooner it ends just get out you know and they were saying this for year after year after year uh and it, it, you know we're discussing how i mean difficult is one word i would argue impossible it is to help build, people build a better society while militarily occupying them uh wasn't wasn't the critical thing to do to it, end it, the it, war you know, the, or the, never the end, have started as i said this there's a start question and then there's and then it's a question of how you end you know you don't end by leaving your biggest air base in the middle of the night and leaving all your equipment there and basically betraying your local afghan army that was they were dying in the thousands in the last few years right you don't end by um sitting in doha and having negotiations for 3 years with the taliban where they agree to not kill any american or you know foreign soldiers but you don't have an agreement that says don't bomb maternity hospitals and civilian uh spaces and and so forth so uh, it's it's about the how that we end or the how that we engage in negotiations with adversaries or or others right because obviously it there there there's some dialogues that happen and 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 most wars these days um even if even if there's a military victory on the in the battlefield you still need the political dialogues to happen afterwards it that's just that's the nature of the conflicts that we're dealing with there's a lot of complexity and um there's always you know you can win but you're still you unless you unless you want to outright get rid of every single person of the population that you were fighting um you're going to have to have some kind some space for negotiations and that's that's the place that we have to think about in terms of how we do it differently but ending it right and evacuating people in danger and not leaving piles of weapons could have been done 19 it, years it earlier it could have been done 19 right? years earlier it could have been done with some planning in advance it could have been done with some conditionality you know do you do you leave do you let 5000 taliban fighters out of jails um without any 
conditions um, on them uh, in terms of their behavior and, and so forth. Uh, it, there's, it, yeah, there's a lot more that could have been done differently and, and possibly could have been done sooner, but it, would, it should have always been done in conjunction with a, with a political process that was inclusive of the voices and the actors on the ground. Is, is, is has anyone learned anything? Uh, is there anything we can and should be doing to help anyone learn that, anything? Um, <laughs> I think that they've learned uh, that they don't want to occupy and send uh, boots on the ground, American soldiers. But now we're doing it with drones, and uh, in other ways, and we're doing we're outsourcing. So you mentioned Libya um, early on. You know what did we do in the context of Libya or even Yemen? We have outsourced. Uh, the war that we're fighting to either, you know, we're supporting the Saudis and giving them, selling them weapons or to the uh, Emirates and, and other Arab states. And they then are funding, fueling militias that are on the ground that um, are, are creating absolute havoc in all these countries. But, you know, look at, if you look at the, the military, uh, we, you know, the hardware that we sold in the last, since 2015 to Saudi Arabia for the Yemen war, um, it's been highly profitable, I guess, for somebody. But again, thousands and thousands of kids are dying in, in Yemen. Uh, clearly, uh, one of the, they used to call it far and away the worst place on earth. I think Afghanistan may have given it some competition now uh, for worst place on earth, and and Syria was competing in there. But they're they're all places with with wars, um, and the weapons largely come from a handful of places, first and foremost, the United States. What about just not arming the rest I wish. of the world? <laughs> and, that's, uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, part of the question that, that what are we doing? Um, why are we, uh, why are we sending and fueling so much warfare around the world? And, um, and what's the end game here? What's it going to look like, you know, combining these wars with, the effects of climate, the effects of displacement, etc. What kind of world are we creating and leaving for for next generations? And do we genuinely think that there isn't going to be blowback? You know that we we can sit here and put a wall and a lid on, on the United States and say, oh, it's just out there. It, you know these things have a way of of um, of affecting our own security at home as well. Um, so so these these are the kinds of questions that I think there's been a you know. It, they, these are hard questions, they're difficult questions, but it's also the way that they're not in our media anywhere. We don't have, we don't have a discussion about any of the wars that we're involved in um, and mainstream media. And so the public doesn't know and then, um, and they feel as if they have no say in it. They could have a say in it because if they write to their congressman and say, stop it, stop selling, stop, you know, we, we, we don't want this kind of defense budget, maybe things would be different. But I don't think that, that people ever imagine that they, that that they have that kind of power within them, even though they could do. I think that's uh, one of the most important points there is to, to tell people, and it's a very difficult one to do. Uh, we've been speaking with Sanam Naragi Anderlini, founder and CEO of International Civil Society Action Network, ICANN. We will have links up at talkworldradio.org. Sanam, thank you for your work and thank, thank you, you so for much. coming thank on the program. Much. This is Talk World Radio. I'm David Swanson. Take action at rootsaction.org. Help end war at worldbeyondwar.org. Read or listen to today's Peace Almanac entry at peacealmanac.org. All past shows can be heard at talkworldradio.org. Talk World Radio is produced in Charlottesville, Virginia, and syndicated by Pacifica Network. There is no way to peace. Peace is the way.